Father in heaven, thank you so much for the way you continue to keep us. We also thank you that you have led us through a period of drought and now beginning to see rains fall. It is something for us to be thankful for. And we pray that you'll give us more rains and rains that won't destroy but rather nurture growth. We pray that even now we may receive the rains of your Holy Spirit as he himself opens your word and speaks to us. Lord, I am here before you. As I open my mouth, fill it with your words. Speak to me so that you may speak through me. And help me and all these my brothers and sisters to decrease that only you will increase. May the voice of Jesus be heard in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we read from Philippians chapter 4 verse 10 to 20 and the topic and the passage that I was given, the topic says, serving the Lord with our resources. Now, I'm sure that many Christians are familiar with verse 13 of that chapter. Verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many of you have memorized that? Very simple, isn't it? How many of you have memorized the other verses in that text? Now, you see, the problem is quite often that particular part, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, is quoted out of context. And what we want to do is try and put it in context. We have a tendency, especially when we feel like we want to feel good as Christians. We want to encourage ourselves. We want to make everyone think that we are excellent, we want to quote that verse, I can do all things in Christ. Well, I want us to settle down a little bit and just think through the particular context that's given to us because my understanding of the text that we read is that Paul is talking about the Philippian partnership with him in mission. Philippian partnership with him in mission. And it is important for us to bear that in mind. Now today we are talking about serving the Lord with all our resources. Psalm 24 says something that I believe that all of us at least should be able to memorize too. It says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now what does that say about our resources? I want to propose to you that there are two questions that we must ask ourselves when we read a text like that. The first question that we must ask ourselves, if the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, then what do you and I have? What do you and I have? The answer is simple. You have nothing. There is nothing that you own. There is nothing that you can say, this is mine to do with as I wish. And therefore it calls upon us to ask ourselves, who is the owner? Who is the owner? Now friends, it is saying that all we need is in his hands. All we are and have is his. All we see, touch, and handle everything, including the ground on which you walk, including the chair on which you sit, including the university in which you study or work, all of them belong to the Lord. And the earlier we understand that, the better. We have nothing. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And that actually means that we owe him everything. We owe him all our life. The only question that we should be asking ourselves, the second question, is what then is our position? What is our role in God's economy? What does God want us to do with what we have? Since nothing is ours, not even the clothes that you put on, not even the body that you have, listen. 
Many years ago, I used to joke with my children. They have now grown up, so now I don't, I'm careful not to joke. And I used to say them that even the bed on which you sleep is mine. And that's true. And listen, when they were growing up, and children would keep on borrowing videos, some of them not so good, and they would put them in their parents' televisions. We say to them, listen, that is our television, that is our video deck. You don't put anything inside there except what we approve. That's how we manage them. You know, you've got to find a way to manage children. For those of you who are parents, you know how it works. So what is our role? What is our position? The Bible is very clear. You and I are stewards. We are stewards. Now to say that we are stewards actually means that God has trusted you. And I like using it that way. God has trusted you with his resources. His resources. Everything. God has trusted you with the intelligence that you have. God has trusted you with the body that you have. God has trusted you with the clothes that you have. God has trusted you with the relationships that you have. God has trusted you with everything that you can talk about. Listen, even for me as vice chancellor, I may be in the position of vice chancellor. God has merely trusted me. And that has a lot of implication. How do I use the position? Many years ago, I was driving in Wandegea, and I had parked somewhere, so I happened to back up, reverse. And I reversed slowly because I could see there was heavy traffic, and somehow, for some reason, the gentleman who was coming in refused to give me space. So, of course, I touched him, just gently, nothing serious. So, I got out of the car. And he also got out of his car. And I was honestly taken aback by his very first question. He said, do you know who I am? <laughs> you see, that is the problem. We do not understand that even the positions we hold are a stewardship. The stewardship. The fact that I'm ordained, that's the stewardship. I own nothing. I have nothing. And at one point, we shall account for everything that we have. Therefore, everything that we do, how we live, whether we pray, whether we are worshiping, and mission in particular that we are talking about now, mission is God's mission. The theologians usually call it Misho Day, meaning it's God's mission. It's not ours. It's God's mission. Everything that we do belongs to him. I have nothing except what I have been given. Now, the Philippians understood this very well. In a way that I think many of us, when we get saved, for some reason we never understand it. They understood that salvation, the moment, the day you are saved, means you have entered mission, God's mission. And that's what Paul is commending them for. Paul says to them, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. And later on he says... In verse 15, you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, in the beginning of the gospel, when you first had the gospel, when you first received it, when you were converted, when you were saved, or whatever you want to call it, the day when you did, you understood that to be saved, to become a Christian, or to be born again, whatever you people want to call it, I know we love these labels. That it means... You have entered into mission. Paul makes clear to us that we may understand. I'm just going to say four things out of this. And then I'll shut up. 
First and foremost, he gives us the motivation. The motivation that was among the Philippians. But we may understand that's the kind of motivation that he asks us also to have. What is the motivation? The motivation for serving with all our resources. And so in that verse 10, he says, I rejoice in the Lord. You were indeed concerned for me. What does that mean? These are people, having understood they were Christians, and now they had to use their Christianity to do mission, to partner with the poor in the ministry. Look what they did. They took their resources. Now, many times we want to think only financial. Not necessarily. I'm talking, that's why I started with that introduction, that we understand everything, not just money. Not just money. But everything. Doesn't Paul again say in Galatians chapter 6, those who are taught should share all good things. It doesn't say all money. All good things with those who teach. You see? In other words, we are talking about everything. But anyway, in this case, he says, you were indeed concerned for me. Now, Paul makes clear that he was not begging or he was not coercing them like you have very popular pastors that you people love. He was not coercing them to give him. No. He says you gave willingly. You loved it. You shared with me. You had compassion for me. You had concern that my subsistence needs would not hinder me from the ministry. You hear that? They took care of his needs. You do the preaching, we'll take care of your needs. That's exactly what Paul says in Galatians, like I just quoted to you. Those who are taught should share all good things with those who teach. And so Paul says, these are people who are motivated by compassion. Sometimes we see situations and they're, you know, we see someone maybe going through a difficult time. We say, oh, oh is not compassion. I want you to understand that. It's not compassion. It's what can you do about it. Paul says, you joined me, you participated with me. And you know what? When you did that, now I can rejoice. You blessed me. Now I'm happy. Now, Dr. J.I. Parker actually says that when we give, it's one of the avenues through which we ourselves get joy. I forget the book uh, that he writes it in, but he, he has a chapter there on joy, just joy. And he says one of the ways that we can actually be very joyful is when we share our resources, when we give our resources. Listen, it was not only Paul who was rejoicing, it was also the Philippians. They were not giving grudgingly. I believe they were following what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, God loves a cheerful giver. They were following that. And so there we go. When we give, we bless. So the first thing for us to understand is what motivated them. They were motivated by concern. They wanted to be sure that Paul can do his ministry without, without the anxiety over his daily needs. Now we've been talking so much about sending missionaries and I pray for that. This morning I prayed for that. Every time I pray for the church, every Tuesday, I pray for the church of Uganda. And I pray that the church of Uganda will become a missionary church. But when it becomes a missionary church, listen, it will be the responsibility of us all. Of us all. To ensure that the people that we send as missionaries are not anxious about their daily needs. That we are praying with them. We are with them. Now, Paul goes on and he says, we serve with our resources because these have been loaned to us. Listen to verse 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your 
credit. Now, given what I have just been saying all along, saying that everything belongs to God, it means God has loaned us, has lent us what we have. He has just loaned us. And you know what happens with a loan? Crane Bank was notorious, has been notorious for lending out and not only collecting the interest that you agreed on at the beginning, but also taking your property. Yeah, some people do. Some, some people who lend are like that. Well, the God that we have may not do that, but be that as it may, whatever you have been given, God expects interest. Now, many people don't want to think in economic terms when it comes to God, but actually, the Bible is clear. You remember the three people, five talents, two talents, one talent? What was he expecting? Interest. Interest. When God loans us, he loans us that we may return with interest. With interest. Now, let's not use this to create a kind of balance book mentality. Because the balance book mentality is what is popular in many churches today. Give him and he'll give you. God owes you nothing. Because even what you're giving him is already his. Isn't it? So there's nothing that you're giving him so that he may give you back. He chooses to bless us, it's true. And I'll be coming back to that. But thirdly, this partnership means serving. We are in a partnership with, to serve with our resources. So he says in verse 15, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Giving is a partnership. That's what we are called. Using our resources, you serve, that is a partnership. And it's a kind of partnership that should not and must not enslave the recipient. Okay, when I give, the person owes me nothing because what I have given actually is God's. That's, you see, that's what is behind it. What I give actually comes from God. So when I give, the person owes me nothing. You know, I hear quite often people say, hmm, he didn't even thank me. Hmm, he did not. Yes, <laughs> of course, out of good courtesy, out of good manners, they should thank you. But listen, you don't need to start, you know, sour graping and, and all that simply because the person hasn't thanked you. To thank you is, they are doing you actually a favor. You know that? They are doing you a favor. They owe you nothing. The recipient owes you nothing. Owes you nothing. To give means we are participating in the ministry of the person to whom we give. To support poor Philippians who are participating in that ministry. Because you can participate either by giving or you can participate by going. Or both. Okay? You can participate. You see, like I said, everything that you have is his. Once you understand that family in your mind, then everything else makes sense. Everything belongs to him. And so some of us will have to go. Some of us will, will give to support. But when we give, they owe us nothing. <laughs> okay? Now the final point that I want to make is for us to understand that serving with our resources actually is a form of worship. Look at verse 19. Let me start from 18. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied having received from, my brother struggled with the name Epaphroditus. Okay? The gentleman was called Epaphroditus. You know it is terrible when people start murdering your name. Fortunately, he's no longer around to hear it, but in heaven when you meet him, don't call him Epaphroditus. Just call him Epaphroditus. I hope I'm even pronouncing it the way he did. 
Having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant, listen to the words, he says, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. What does he call it? He calls it a fragrant offering, a sacrifice. That is worship language. And that's the reason why the offertory in our churches is in the midst of the liturgy. It's within the church service. It's part of worship. When we come to the time when we are giving the offertory, please don't think that we have put aside worship. It's part of worship. Indeed, the, the very thing that you should be doing as you give the money, as you touch your pockets, or you give whatever you are giving, know that you must give it with an attitude of worship. That's what he says, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice, acceptable and pleasing to God. And that means we must not do it carelessly. I like that those lines uh, in the, uh, the wedding liturgy, that you must not do it carelessly, selfishly, and so on and so forth, but after serious thought. That's how it should be. Worship is serious business. You know, when we enjoy worship, sometimes we forget that. It's important for us to enjoy, to celebrate in our worship. But listen, quite often what I'm seeing more and more is people forgetting the seriousness of this particular activity. And we think that God is my buddy. He's not. He's the God of heaven. What is the song you are singing? How great? He's our God. If you do it flippantly, if you do it like you are playing, my dear, you are not saying how great is our God. You are saying, they say you are great, but actually in my life you are small. If in the use of your resources, it's not worship. True worship, because you see, true worship is to give to God only that which is due to him alone. No other. Now, if you cannot give that way, then you're not worshiping. Paul makes very clear, this is worship. It is a surrender to God so that we are accepted and we are, we are pleasing him. Worship. Serving with our resources. And so it was in Mark chapter 12, verse 41, 44, Jesus was seated on one side and then he was looking at all the people who were bringing a lot of money and they were putting it in the bags there. You know the story, don't you? And then he saw this woman and she came very poor, this poor old widow. In fact, when I was in the U.S., a friend who is a coin collector showed me what that coin looked like in those days. I wish I could have just taken it away from him and brought it to you. But it belongs to God. I will see it one day. So, she comes and she, brought, she drops in just those two little coins. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? You see, it has nothing to do with how much we have. Many times for us, we think that it is the people in the Western world who must give. We have nothing. We have a poverty mentality. We have a mentality that's not from God. Listen, the God of a thousand hills who has a cattle of a thousand hills is not just the God of the West. He's also our God, isn't he? And if we believe that everything belongs to him, even those who have little need to give. And Jesus commended her. She has put in more than all those. And you know what? There is a, a difference in language there. You go back and read that text. It's very interesting. Because for her, Jesus says she gave, but for the others, she, Jesus said they contributed. Have you ever seen that? He said they contributed because for her, she put in all that she had to live on. Everything. 
She was serving the Lord with her resources. The little that she had. If you put it in the language of today, listen. After giving, she went back home and in the refrigerator there was no bread, there were no greens, there was no meat, there was nothing. That's what happened. All she had to live on. And then Paul says, if we are faithful in serving the Lord with all our resources, verse 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Amen? Only if we serve him with all our resources. Let us pray. I want us to take just a moment for each one of us to reflect on our lives and ask ourselves where we are at. It may be people who are needy in our midst. It may be those who are in ministry that need our support. The students who are looking for fees. Many times we look at our own needs, even the ones we call them needs, and then we are unwilling to help. I don't want to pray a long prayer. For each one of you knows what to pray to the Lord. That we may learn to worship him. With what he has entrusted us with. Grant Lord that we will learn to be good stewards of the resources you've given us. To the glory and honor of Jesus Christ.